my name is Gohar Jan, the life and times of a musician uh, is the biography of the first Indian woman, uh, an artist of the subcontinent who recorded her voice on the gramophone when the recording te technology came to India in 1902. Uh, so the book actually traces uh, through authentic documents, uh, you know, the, the ups and downs of Gohar Jan's life. Uh, paints a portrait also of the times in which uh, she lived in because that is something that most biographers uh, seldom touch upon. It's usually the life that is that becomes important though every biography is subtitled very fashionably as the life and times of so and so uh, but not often do people also document the times because I feel every subject is a uh, product of the circumstances and of the times in which he or she lived. And so this, this book talks about uh, the Tawaif culture, the courtesan culture in North India, in Calcutta, uh, in which uh, Goharjan was a part of which uh, culture and she uh, kind of defined it in uh, more ways than one. So it's a, it's a story of uh, a human spirit, of a woman's determination to make it big despite several handicaps that she suffered in life. And so it's uh, to that extent a very tragic and moving story of this individual. Well, uh, serendipity rules my life and so this also happened rather serendipitously. Uh, I was researching on my first book which was Splendors of Royal Mysore, uh, the untold story of the Wadiyars on the 600 year history of the Wadiyar royal family of Mysore. And while researching for that, uh, I just accidentally happened to stumble upon Gohar Jan's reference um, in, in a box file of letters that were there in the Mysore palace, very beautifully catalogued and uh, maintained. And uh, though she was from Calcutta, so she and such a national and an international celebrity of her times, she actually died in Mysore in 1930. She was a state guest of the Maharaja of Mysore for two years. And all these letters portrayed the picture of a aging diva uh, in the last days of her life, very frustrated, uh, emotionally broken. At the same time, uh, you know, uh, pleading with the Maharaja's government for help, for don't cut my income tax, increase my salary and those kind of uh, entreaties which were actually refused very stoically by the uh, government. So uh, that kind of fixated me to her. Uh, I really uh, was intrigued as to why such a celebrity and it, the, the, let, the box file actually said the first gramophone superstar of India. Why did someone like that have to come from distant Calcutta in those days travel was such a uh, you know, problem across Calcutta and Mysore and come here and die in anonymity. And so that is what fixated me to her and I then um, you know, literally chased her through the length and breadth of India from the place of her death. I went to Azamgarh and Banaras, Darbhanga, Rampur, uh, Calcutta, Mysore, Mumbai, every place where she spent significant portions of her life and it was almost like piecing different parts of a jigsaw puzzle together. Well, documentation is something that we in India woefully lack in and I think uh, it's, it's a quintessentially Indian virtue to let the past lie unattended and let it rot, let it uh, totally uh, get destroyed and the problem is more germane when it comes to the performing arts because the performing arts has never had this discipline of writing things down and documenting it and more so in music which has been an oral tradition. So it's all been uh, stories that have been transmitted from teacher to taught. Uh, it's a Guru Shishya Parampara that has existed. So even stories and uh, anecdotes about musicians have always gone word of mouth. And so uh, it's, it was very difficult for me to actually find, uh, you know, original, uh, the people who actually knew her. Uh, one is she was dead 80 years ago. She was a Tawaif, so there were no legal heirs, there was no lineage whom I could go and speak to. So it, when I started, it was literally like getting into a tunnel without an idea whether there was light at the end of it. Uh, but then I was piecing together and every city gave me different leads. So other than the archives, I spoke to a few contemporary musicians. I later realized that Gohar also fought two very uh, major court cases in her life. Uh, one where she had to prove her parentage in court and the other where, uh, you know, she had a love affair with, a, with her secretary and that landed in a bitter divorce, uh, which is what led to her becoming a pauper and then seeking refuge in Mysore. So the accounts of uh, these court cases were in, um, I expected it to be in the Calcutta High Court but then the High Court in its supreme wisdom had decided to make a bonfire of all old 
civil documents which were of not too much of a worth. So that again was a Sherlock Holmes discovery to find out uh, these documents in the house of a clerk who belonged to the Calcutta High Court and who, whose widow gave it to me with a lot of reluctance. So it was literally each each trail of discovery, uh, I think I could write a separate book on them because uh, it was really, uh, as I said, putting, uh, piecing together different fragments of a jigsaw puzzle. I got a, a very exquisite collection of uh, poetry, Urdu poetry of Gohar Jan's mother, Badi Malka Jan, uh, nowhere in India but then in uh, London and that was also by coincidence. Uh, this It's an exquisite book of about 400 ghazals uh, called Magzane Ulfate Malika or the treasure trove of Malika Jan's love and that had biographical details about the mother and the daughter and there were accounts in Berlin of uh, Frederick William Gaisberg who was a German agent who came in 1902 and uh, recorded Gohar Jan. So he had uh, spoken about how she came dressed to the studio, how she bargained every time for a higher remuneration and always got it because she was the superstar uh, and so all these accounts, first person accounts in a way uh, helped me to piece the story together. A major part of the book is also, uh, uh, you know, the, the growth of recording technology worldwide, the invention of the phonogram and the gramophone, which uh, revolutionized uh, audio recording all over the world. And a lot of interesting details and tidbits which I got from the EMI archive in London where I spent uh, time to uh, see what the letter correspondences between the head office in Calcutta and the London office, uh, what were the, uh, you know, the, the gramophone company would send their agents all over India to do a market research of sorts, saying what languages were more prevalent in the country, what kind of songs uh, were more popular. Without understanding anything about the music of the country, they were here just to make it a commercial proposition. Now, so that was a, that was a study of uh, cross-cultural, uh, you know, existences which was with a commercial consideration, which was very interesting. So I do talk about the kind of, uh, you know, uh, influences that Indian music had on the West and vice versa and Frederick William Gaysberg for instance in his diaries when he initially came to India to Calcutta he was led to all these notch parties and uh, theatre performances by the theatres in Calcutta and he was terribly disgusted with what he heard uh, because most of these theatre stars they tried to impress the European by actually uh, playing to him badly uh, arranged western songs to catch his attention whereas he was looking for authentic Indian music. And so in his uh, diaries also he says, what a crass country, why have I come here at all and uh, uh, I have to forget all my, uh, you know, musical training and uh, European operas uh, that I, uh, you know, heard back home. And so a lot of that changed when he heard Gohar Jan in a uh, Zamindar soiree some day. And so all these beautiful anecdotes of the West and the East coming in uh, contact with each other uh, was something I captured. At the same time, another revelation for me personally was uh, when recording technology came to India, it was actually not the men but the women who uh, embraced this technology. And this was not only true only of uh, uh, North India or any particular part of India, but all over India, uh, in the North, in the South, uh, East and the West. You had women like Gohar Jan, Janki Bai of Allahabad, Zohra Bai of Agra, Malka Jan Agrewali. In the South, you had women like uh, Salem Godavari, Coimbatore Tai. Bangalore Nagratnamma, Binodini Dasi in uh, Calcutta uh, of the Star Theatre. So uh, these are names whom contemporary musicians, Hindustani, Karnataka or anybody have completely forgotten uh, because one is of course most of them belong to this community of Tawaifs and Devdasis and so uh, there was this whole demonization of women who were in the performing arts. They were all clubbed as mere prostitutes and the whole system was abolished and with that the narrative of the country has become such that, uh, you know, they have been consciously obliterated from national consciousness, from, uh, from musical discourse. So, uh, I, I do make mentions of all these different women, their contributions and how, but for them, you know, actually taking the onus of getting into that makeshift studio and recording their voices. Uh, in audio recording, we wouldn't have had a microphone like this which amplifies your voice. And there were so many different logistic challenges too uh, because it was the era of acoustic recording where there used to be a, a horn that was fitted on the wall and the singer had to crane his or her head into that and scream as loudly as uh, he or she could. And depending on how loudly they screamed, there would be a stylus on the other end which would vibrate and cut etches on a shellac and that's how the recording was made. And uh, since most Indian musicians while 
singing, they tend to move their hands and heads. That would spoil the quality of recording. So there would be two agents who would hold your hands, one who would hold your head and push you into that horn and force you to bellow hard. So uh, all these, uh, you know, the experiences of the artist, what, what, a, uh, what a nightmare it must have been. Uh, you know, one is overcome all these social stigmas that was associated with uh, recording. Like if you record into that evil English instrument, you will lose your voice uh, and things like this, which is what kept the men folk away. And also all these logistic challenges of screaming into horns. The third important one being that all these records were only of three minutes duration. And in that three minutes, uh, you know, they had to compress something as expansive as Indian classical music, which relies on improvisation and uh, exposition of a raga that can go on all through the night. To do that in three minutes, like pressy writing in literature, you have to compress all of that and, uh, you know, record. So it was really a tribute to these uh, women of that era who went ahead and recorded. But sadly, that is something that has largely remained undocumented. We have lost uh, very valuable slices of our cultural history, the life stories of these women, the struggles they faced. Uh, and through this book on Gauharjan, I wanted to bring to light the condition of several of her contemporaries who have faced similar, uh, you know, anonymity and literally thrown into the dustbins of history. The, the time period that the book captures is uh, immediately after the Sepoy mutiny because that's uh, 1857 and that's when uh, Badi Malka Jan was born and so uh, and she was born around the, the, the places where the Sepoy mutiny was uh, most rampant uh, in the United Provinces of those times, so, uh, Azamgarh, Allahabad, what was the impact that it had on the women of the performing arts and that's something even captured uh, in Umrao Jan uh, in the novel and in the film of course. Uh, and then the narrative moves to Banaras where the mother and daughter went and she was actually born an Armenian Christian and not even as a Indian, she was not even fully Indian or uh, Muslim. A Hindu grandmother, a British grandfather, an Armenian Christian father and that was the confusing lineage that she had. And then they moved to Banaras, uh, converted to Islam, uh, became Tawaifs of the city there, took to performing arts and then migrated to Calcutta which was then the cultural centre of the northern, the Gangetic belt, uh, thanks to the uh, you know movement of Wajid Ali Shah. So Wajid Ali Shah's uh, court had Malka Jan as a, a court musician. So this whole period of this transition of patronage from Lucknow to Calcutta and how that impacted Hindustani music is also something I cover. And then 1902 becomes the other landmark year when recording technology comes, and Gohar is the natural choice for the company because she is the most visible and celebrated face of Indian classical music there. And then the narrative moves almost all over India from Calcutta, she moves all over the country uh, to Mumbai where she has a lover uh, for a long time who dies an unnatural death, then it moves to Darbhanga, Rampur and then the final death uh, of Gaurjan in Mysore uh, which is in 1930. So this was the time period of uh, her life story. So uh, while the, the early story of the recording uh, industry is something I have captured and this is 1902 to 1925 uh, when electrical recording first came in then microphones uh, started coming in, lot of men started then getting more comfortable to come and record. So I do trace uh, this transition also and this uh, was also uh, you know it, around the same time you had this anti-notch campaign which was launched against the Tawaifs and Devdasis and they were uh, you had the anti-Devdasi uh, act that was passed in different parts of the country. So I do talk about that and also about the nationalistic, uh, the freedom struggle where the reformers, the social reformers actually started looking at music, dance, the performing arts uh, as a tool to reclaim a sense of national identity, of national pride. Uh, and so it had to be reclaimed from these debased, immoral women and actually, you know, given a nationalist, a, the national music of India. And so the Thumris, the Dadras and Padams and Javlis, which largely had a lot of erotic content, uh, you know, uh, of these women, uh, their compositions, their performances, uh, these were all exorcised from the composition, compositions were censored, cleaned, because one is, of course, it did good to the art form because it brought uh, music to the homes of common uh, middle class respected uh, families of uh, middle class people and so it was so much more easier for boys and girls of middle class families to take to performance which would not have been the case uh, even 20-30 years before uh, that. 
so while that happened uh, the the performers itself all these uh, tawaifs and devdasis were actually thrown into the dustbins of history with no plans made for their rehabilitation so most of them actually died in penury or they started resorting to fl uh, flesh trade to survive so i do capture this transition uh, period in indian uh, the, the annals of indian music and most of the other women actually started looking at different uh, other routes for their survival films being a major one so at least the early uh, bombay cinema had a lot of these uh, women jaddan bai and her daughter nargis for example uh, belong to the same lineage and so a lot of them started moving to bombay to uh, find alternative uh, uh, means of livelihood in the south the famous ex example is that of ms subhlakshmi who had to who came from a devdasi background but she had to reinvent herself in a way that she was socially acceptable and then became this whole symbol of brahminical piety and uh, purity and today the lord of tirupati actually wakes up to her suprabhatam so that's a, that's the transition period that most of these women charted so i do talk about this uh, interesting period too where they were forced to reinvent themselves to survive